Hey guys, it's Makeshift and today I'm going to talk through some of my favorite tools that I use when I make plushies. I'll talk through tools that I use when sewing plushies, also when I do embroidery, as well as some patterning, and also just some odds and ends that might come up every once in a while, but nothing that I use every day. I won't be totally comprehensive in all the tools I use because every once in a while there will be a situation where I need something very specific for a one-off project, but these tools that I walk through are going to be some of the most common things that I use every day when making plushies. So first, obviously, you're going to need some fabric, and my most commonly used fabric is Minky, and I recommend checking out my video on working with Minky. I'll go through a lot more detail in that video about how to work with Minky for making plushies, and I will here. It's one of the most commonly used fabrics for making plushies because it is very soft. It has a pile to it, which means it has a fur-like texture, so it's good for making animal-like plushies. And it's just very soft and comes in a lot of different colors, so it's very, very popular for making plushies. It is somewhat difficult to work with because it stretches and it's a little, little bit slippery, so it can be difficult to get used to, but I actually find it easier to work with minky now than fleece, which is another commonly used fabric for making plushies. The colors depend on where you get it, and there's different types like anti-pill, which is this one here. Anti-pill means that the fleece has been treated to prevent these balls of fabric from appearing on their own, and that seems kind of counterintuitive because this anti-pill fleece has those balls, but that means that it's been made to be consistent because if you have a normal fleece then over time as it wears and tears you're going to get this little texture on your fabric but it's going to be uneven and it's just going to come up maybe where it has a little bit more usage in certain areas where it rubs or where it has some damage so the anti-pill prevents that from happening basically by having that happen on the whole fabric so it's a little bit cleaner it, it's a little frustrating because you have anti-pill fleece and you have normal fleece and maybe you can't find a certain color in anti-pill versus the other kind of fleece, but it's another good option for making plushies and it's certainly cheaper than Minky is. If you're just getting started, maybe you want to try with fleece and then move on to Minky. But you do have to keep in mind that fleece stretches differently than Minky does. So if you were to make the exact same pattern out of fleece and then make it out of Minky, your plushies are actually going to come out looking a little bit differently because the fleece stretches differently than the Minky does, which means when you stuff it, it's going to have a different shape in the end between the two fabrics. So. This is one of the reasons why if you decide to start patterning your own plushies, you actually need to make test plushies out of the same fabric that you intend to use for your final plush. Because if you pattern something in fleece and you like the way it looks and then you go make it out of minky, it's going to come out different. So unfortunately because minky is so expensive, it makes it more pricey to pattern minky plushies even down to the fact that you should use the same brand of Minky that you intend to use in the final thing because even different brands stretch differently. And obviously you're not just limited to Minky or Fleece for making plushies. You can pretty much use whatever you want. You need to keep in mind the quality of the fabric you want to be using. Something nice. I've heard of people using suede or deer skin for human plushies because they don't have this pile that Minky has. So it looks more smooth, more like human skin, uh, but also still has some softness to it. So obviously you can sew plushies together completely by hand, but if you decide to get serious about plush making, I highly recommend getting a sewing machine. And even if you want to try getting into sew into sewing your own plushies, I recommend maybe getting a lower end one because I feel like hand sewing plushies might almost turn you away from the hobby because it is so difficult. But I have a Brother SC1900. It does both normal machine sewing and embroidery. I worked with an SE400 for a very long time 
which just has a smaller embroidery size, but that was a great machine and it got me by for many years before I decided that I wanted to upgrade to a machine with a bigger hoop. But if you're looking to get in into plushies and you like to do embroidery as well, SE400 is a really great machine and I highly recommend it for beginners if you can afford the investment. So when I say it does both machine sewing and embroidery, what that means is that this can convert into an embroidery machine. So if I remove this piece here, it has this attachment which you just slide in and now it can do embroidery. So it's very nice because I like it because it also saves space because I don't need to have both a sewing machine and an embroidery machine. I can just have one that does both. And for me so far, because I just do this for a hobby, I haven't felt like I have the need to get an entire embroidery machine just to do embroidery. I'm getting by just fine with just this five by seven hoop area that the SC1900 offers. I do have a serger that I use occasionally as well, but this is mostly because I used to make cosplays a lot, so having a serger was really handy for that. So I tend to only use my serger when I make certain types of plushy clothes where maybe I'm not lining it and I'd like to finish the edge a little bit more cleanly, but the serger I really only use here and there for plush making. Another tool that I talk about a lot is my walking foot. So this is an attachment for your sewing machine that helps you sew minky, fleece, other stretchy fabrics. And I, I just use this all the time in general, unless I'm sewing something super small, because as you can see, this is kind of a, a big foot here at the bottom. But uh, a walking foot has an extra set of feed dogs on it. So that this white piece here is uh, feed dogs that are on the top. So your sewing machine will naturally have feed dogs on the bottom of the fabric, but this adds an extra set on the top. So it actually kind of walks along the fabric and helps guide it through your machine as you sew. So it makes sewing minky especially easier and it's a good investment if you really want to get into sewing plushies frequently. Um, I like it a lot and highly recommend it. For machine sewing plushies together, I just use a normal dual duty all purpose polyester thread. There's nothing super special about this thread. It's just very general uh, as the name implies and comes in all sorts of different colors. Um, I don't use anything heavy duty, anything like quilting. That stuff typically isn't uh, good for your machine to use. I do use a heavier duty one to hand sew some pieces together sometimes, which I'll talk through later in the video, but for machine sewing plushies together, I just use this general dual duty all purpose thread. I do have a pretty good size collection of thread just to match all the different colors of Minky with the thread. Um, some people I've heard of don't even bother with that. They just pretty much only use white or black. Um, but since I have a pretty big collection anyway, I do like to purchase matching thread, especially if I'm gonna be doing hand sewing on uh, for something that isn't going to need a lot of strength. I like having the, the matching thread. Next, you'll need some pins and a pin cushion. There are a huge variety of pins that you can use. It's really just about finding one that you like the most. The recommendations I can make are finding one that has a good size, a good length to it, because when you're pinning plushies, you'll often be pinning through several layers of fabric, and Minky is pretty thick, so you want to have one with a good length and the size of the head as well. If they're bigger, I find them easier to work with because they're easier to grab. So this is just my preferred pin that I came up with. I couldn't even tell you the exact dimensions of this, and because of that, I've ended up buying the wrong pin several times, but uh, find one that works for you. There's also ones with different heads, like hearts or buttons. Um, so maybe if you don't like the, the round shape, uh, you'll find something else that works for you. And I have another example here where you can see how this one is smaller. So if I take out one of my other pins, 
can see the difference here where it's longer and the, the head is a bit bigger. So this was one of my failed purchases up there. I decided I don't like these as much as this other type here. But you'll want to purchase a decent amount of these. You'll go through them pretty quickly, especially if you're working on a, a big project and uh, they tend to disappear pretty easily. So uh, just get yourself a nice little pack of them. Next up are scissors. I have many different types for different purposes. And so the, the first ones I'll talk about are for making large cuts into fabric. So you'll need a, a good size pair for cutting your pattern pieces out of your fabric. My favorite ones have ended up being these Fiskars uh, cutting shears, I believe they're called. And rather than sharpening them, I just replace them every so often. And I'm probably actually up for replacing mine. So I've develop my own rotation system because you only want to cut fabric with your fabric scissors. You might be tempted to cut paper or other types of things uh, with your, your fabric scissors, but you want to avoid that because it'll dull the scissors faster than if you just cut fabric with them. And you want to keep these as sharp as possible for as long as possible because they are somewhat expensive. So when I feel like my scissors are about at the end of their life, I just rotate them. So these are my non-fabric scissors now for cutting other things that I need to cut. I actually use these to cut stabilizer, so I just mark them with an S, and I won't say what the S stands for to keep it family friendly, but just mark your old scissors that are for non-fabric somehow so you keep in mind these are your non-fabric scissors and then these are for cutting fabric um, i've tried out many different brands over the years but these have been my favorite i just like how they feel uh, when cutting and it's kind of important to get ones that are comfortable for you because they if you cut out a lot of fabric, it can be pretty rough on your hands after a while. And I also actually tend to loosen this screw a little bit to make it easier to open and close them just again so it's not as rough on your hands. Because those scissors are so large, you're going to need some smaller scissors as well for some finer cuts like cutting thread or maybe making some finer detail cuts into your fabric. So I have again, a pretty big selection of different scissors for that. I just have general pairs for cutting into the fabric. If it's something smaller, I'll tend to use these for cutting tiny little holes into fabric if I need to insert something into it, like a joint. Um, so you'll need to have some dedicated fabric scissors that are smaller for that. I also have a dedicated pair of non-fabric scissors, so cutting paper, uh, cutting stabilizer, things like that. It's just something that's not as big as the previous scissors. And then finally, my favorite ones are these curved embroidery scissors. So I'd say even if you're not doing embroidery, these are super helpful because you can get really close to the fabric because of this curved design. So I do use these for trimming off embroidery, but I also use them for trimming off the extra thread from machine sewing plushies as well. But again, it's all about finding a type of scissor that you like and works for you. I'd say the most important thing is if you're buying a smaller pair of scissors to see if they're made for fabric or they're good for fabric because some scissors aren't going to be intended for cutting fabric. If you guys are going to be working with faux fur at all, you'll also need a razor. So you don't want to use a standard set of scissors on faux fur because when you cut through the faux fur, you're actually going to be cutting the fur itself, which is not something you want to do. You only want to cut the backing of the faux fur. So for that, the best tool is a razor. So I just have a pretty standard one, nothing special about it. I can actually snap off the razor when it gets a bit dull so that I can get a new fresh edge on the end. But that's about it, just getting a standard razor for cutting through faux fur if you're going to work with it. So you also need some sort of fabric pen for tracing your pattern onto your fabric to cut it out and also for making other marks onto your fabric for something like possibly a seam line that you need to sew along 
or if you're trying to draw a head onto your plush to translate into embroidery later, you need some kind of tool to do that. I don't recommend using just a normal pen uh, because I've found that in the past that it can actually bleed through the fabric where you can see it on the other side. So I recommend getting a few different types. Uh, one is a water soluble fabric pen. So I found this brand on Amazon that I really like. Comes in a pretty wide variety of colors so you can pick a color that works best for your type of fabric that you're working with. And these are very potent, so they will stay on the fabric for a very long time where you do need to wash off the, the pen with water. Um, so that can be a bit annoying if you are tracing your pattern onto fabric, especially if it's a lighter color like a, a white or a light pink. If you trace any one of these colors, it's going to remain on the edges if you don't cut it completely away and it can show through to the other side. So you do have to take that extra step of washing your fabric. So because of that, I do also recommend getting a, a disappearing ink marker. So this I just picked up at Joann's and this one disappears after a few hours uh, after you draw it onto your fabric. So I do prefer to trace my pattern pieces with a disappearing ink marker and then if I'm doing anything more permanent, like drawing a, a face onto a plush that I later want to scan into my computer to make an embroidery file out of it, I will draw it in my water soluble one because that won't disappear. In the past, before I found these, I'd use my disappearing ink marker for drawing on a face and if I didn't finish it that day, then the next day I'd have to redraw the face. But the problem with all of these is that they don't work well on dark fabric. So that's why I also have silver Sharpies because I use these to trace on pattern pieces for dark fabrics like black or dark blue. These colors just won't show up on dark fabric. So I rely on silver Sharpies for that purpose. Even though it's permanent, I haven't had any issues with it bleeding through to the front side of the minky, so, so far I've been pretty happy with the silver sharpie for that use. And for doing various measurements on your plushies, just get a couple different measuring tools. One's just a standard measuring tape. Nothing special to say about this one besides the fact that I probably need a new one because this one's getting pretty old. Um, but this big old ruler is also a favorite tool of mine. It's a 3 inch by 18 inch ruler so it's really helpful for getting straight edges when you're trying to draw something out for cutting out like a straight line for a tube or something like that and I also use this a lot for patterning. And so you also need some different needles for machine sewing your plushies and that all depends on what type of fabric you're sewing. So I have a bunch of different types as you can see. Uh, starting with just a universal needle, so this is for non-stretch fabrics. If I'm sewing clothing for plushies, I often use real clothing fabric that you would use on typical everyday clothes, so that often requires a needle for non-stretchy fabrics. And then if you're sewing minky or fleece or anything else that stretches, you're going to need a stretch needle, so this is by far my most used needle. And then I also have some other ones, so this is for jersey fabric, so it's a special type of knit fabric often used for clothes. Uh, it just has a little bit different structure to help with sewing those jersey knits. I have ones for jeans, so if I'm sewing denim, I'll have these jeans needles. And then I have leather as well, so if I have any faux leather for making clothes, I have some needles for that. Um, but I'd say at the very very minimum start with the uh, stretch needles and universal needles But you also need to double check to make sure that anything you buy can fit into your sewing machine For stuffing plushies. I just use a normal polyfill, which is probably the most popular brand out there It's just the standard type. I buy it in a gigantic box of either 10 or 15 pounds 
Um, it gets really unwieldy really fast. It expands to be a gigantic height, so I try to only snip a small hole in it and stick my hand in there and grab out what I need. But it's good to buy it in bulk if you plan on making a lot of plushies because you will go through it kind of fast. Recently I've been hearing about a new type of stuffing that's using like these Squishmallows type plush that are mochi that it's made out of a special type of fabric that stretches a, a ton and so it uses a, a different type of stuffing and you can buy it from Daiso but it's pretty hard to get a hold of uh, but I'll put up a picture of what it looks like and it's just a kind of a different structure. Um, so I guess if you're making these mochi type of plushies you should be on the lookout for that. I've also just heard of people buying the Squishmallows plush and taking it apart for the stuffing rather than trying to source the stuffing themselves. I also occasionally use these poly pellets for making beanie type plushies. They are tiny little plastic beads that you can stuff any beanie plushies with to give it a little bit more weight in that beanie baby type fill. Um, I prefer using these plastic ones over something like rice or beans or some kind of food product that I've heard about people using to stuff their plushies because it's a little bit more sanitary and has lasted me a very long time because I don't make that many beanie type plushies. A couple of other materials that I commonly use in plush making are felt, a stiff felt, and quilt batting. The felt I'll use for adding stability to pieces without having to use wire. And this is really mainly used for when I make smaller wings, often ears that are really tall. I'll use a couple layers of really thick felt to add some stability to the piece so that it doesn't fall over without having to use wire. The quilt batting I'll use for adding dimension to pieces I'll also use this in wings to give the feathers a thicker look instead of just having the two layers of minky. I'll put this on the inside of the piece. And then another one of my favorite tutorials I've made is how to make the puffy paw pads through applique. So I layer this underneath the minky before I do applique for paw pads and it gives it a really nice puffy look. So this is a couple materials you can buy to help add some dimension to your plushies. I don't hand sew my plushies together, but regardless of that, you'll always have to do some form of hand sewing on your plushies. Even if you machine sew the entire thing together, you're going to have a hole in some part of it where you have to flip it right side out and stuff it. So you'll need some needles for hand sewing as well. I just bought this variety pack of assorted needles for hand sewing and they have different eye shapes as well as lengths and uh, even how sharp they are. So I just pick one and, and go with that. Uh, I also have these really long doll needles that are very useful and highly recommend picking some of these up, especially if you're going to be doing something like needle sculpting a face or hands. The extra length on them is super useful and definitely uh, very helpful if you're making a lot of plushies with detail. If I do run into the situation where I have to hand sew something important on like a head or a limb, I do use this heavy duty thread. It's Coates and Clark nylon thread and it's extra strong so it'll provide a little bit extra support where the normal all-purpose polyester thread won't. You can see it's quite a bit thicker than normal thread. And it doesn't fray as easily as normal cotton thread does, but uh, it's definitely not something that I use all the time and I don't use this in my sewing machine at all because I don't think it would work properly. So now moving on to embroidery essentials. So you're going to need a hoop for doing your embroidery on your embroidery machine and your embroidery machine will come with a hoop standard uh, to whatever size that your embroidery machine can do. So my maximum of my sewing machine is a five by seven area. So it came with a five by seven hoop, but I also went ahead and purchased an extra pack on Amazon of more hoops. So it came with a five by seven as well. So I actually have two of these, which is very helpful. It came with this really big five by 12 one and even though my embroidery machine can only do a maximum 
of a five by seven area, this kind of cheats the system by having three different attachment points. So it can do a five by seven here, it can do a five by seven in the middle, and then it can do a five by seven in the top. So it gives an extra few inches of room to make an extra long design that you wouldn't be able to do if you just have a hoop with a single attachment point like they usually do. It also came with a 4x4, which is standard in machines like a SE400, and then it also came with this little tiny one, which I tend to use if I'm letting my sewing machine stitch out something like a nose or teeth. For me, something very small that requires a lot of precision, I'll just go ahead and hoop two pieces of fabric in here and let my embroidery machine stitch it out for me as opposed to doing it by hand. But I really love this pack of different embroidery hoops. I use every single one of them and I find them all very helpful. And I try to maximize my area here so if I'm making something that can fit in my 4x4 I'll use my 4x4 so I don't waste more materials than I have to because all the stabilizer and the fabric and everything becomes very expensive very fast. So you also need some type of stabilizer for hooping into your embroidery hoops so that your fabric isn't just floating. You need some sort of backing on it so that it has some strength to it. So I have a few different types. Um, I have my normal cut away stabilizer, which is my preferred kind, but I also have some tear away as well. So for the cutaway, I have a couple different sizes because I do have all those different size hoops. So I try to use the appropriate size stabilizer for whatever hoop I'm using so that I waste less of this. And so I just bought some rolls off of Amazon, but you can also find this at Joann's. Um, and just keep in mind that there's different types like the cutaway, the tearaway. Um, there's also kind that you can actually iron it onto your fabric so that it fuses on, but I just prefer using the, the cutaway type here. For the tearaway stabilizer, this is useful if you're using a pattern that's an in the hoop pattern where you're just doing embroidery and then you lay a piece of fabric on top of that and then the machine sews it together for you. So you're essentially making the entire plush in the hoop. So when you do turn it right side out, you can actually just tear this stabilizer off from your stitches so that it makes it more clean when you turn it right side out. Because with the cutaway stabilizer, it makes your edges a bit more stiff because you can't actually get it out from underneath the stitches. So you can see that this is more thin. You can actually see my hand through the stabilizer. Um, I don't like using this for normal everyday embroidery because it does tear very easily. If you're doing something very dense like a satin stitch or even some bigger embroidery pieces, it can actually just tear away from the fabric while you're embroidering, not when you intend to tear it away. So you'll have to double it up occasionally, which can lead to more waste. So I prefer just using the cutaway stabilizer for most circumstances, unless I'm doing it in the hoop pattern. So you'll need to attach that stabilizer to your fabric in some sort of way before you go ahead and do your embroidery. So my preferred method is this basting adhesive. And I've bought different brands and it's been called different things, but the most important thing is just to make sure that it says that it's good for embroidery. So you just spray this to your stabilizer, not to your fabric, but to your stabilizer. And then you can lay the fabric on top of that and then your fabric won't shift around while you're doing the embroidery. So this is my preferred method. I've seen people just use painter's tape as well, but I just like using this uh, basing adhesive here. And it lasts a, quite a while, but um, it also is kind of expensive, but uh, I like this a lot. And just for when I do spray my stabilizer, I just have a little piece of cardboard that I'll lay the stabilizer on here and then I'll spray it while it's on this cardboard because it is very sticky so you don't want to 
spray it onto like a table or something because then it'll get very gummy. You can see how much minky residue is left here on this cardboard just from all the stickiness left over from that adhesive. If you're embroidering onto minky or fleece or some kind of fabric with a sink to it, which means that it's a thick fabric and when you sew it, the stitches sink into the fabric, you'll need some water soluble stabilizer for the top of that. And that just prevents the stitches from sinking too far into the fabric because if that happens, then they can kind of disappear into the fabric. So the shape that you want won't completely come out and it'll also just distort the design in general. By far my favorite brand is Salvi, and I have tried a couple other brands, but the Salvi brand has been my favorite, and it's specifically this Sulky Salvi. So there's a few different types. Um, these are both the same type, just a general water-soluble stabilizer. They're just two different sizes, again, because I have different size hoops, so I try to maximize my materials where I can. And it's just really nice, it's very soft. And generally you can just tear this completely away from your design. It'll leave little remainders and like the edges around where your design is that you might need to take some water to to wash it off. But you do want to tear this off and then wash away any of the excess. And generally I'll just wet my finger and run it over it. Sometimes I'll use a washcloth to uh, wash off the excess, but you don't want to just wash off the whole piece because then it's going to turn into a gummy mess but really like this brand it is my favorite by far there's also ultra solvy and so this is generally for if you're making patches it's a lot thicker than the normal type so you can see that it's not as transparent as the last kind is and it's not as soft so this is really if you're trying to use this as a, a underneath stabilizer really for, like I said, making patches. You don't want to use this on top of your embroidery because it won't tear away as easily. It's gonna be harder to wash off. So if you're making patches, the Ultra Solvy is the way to go. And you don't put that on top. You put that as your stabilizer in the back so that you can just tear it off in the end. There is special thread for embroidery because it is shinier than your typical thread that you use for machine sewing. So there's a ton of different brands of embroidery thread, but you just want to make sure that it is labeled for embroidery. And the types that I've used are Coates and Clark. I've used Sulky as well. And then the Sulky also comes in these, the smaller quantity here. And then I have Guterman as well. And my driving force behind what brand I pick is really just the color. Um, I tend to gravitate towards the Coates and Clark because it comes in the larger sizes if I'm doing standard colors like black or white. If I'm finding a very specific color, I'll try to get one of those smaller ones because I'm not going to be using it as much. And it is pretty expensive, this embroidery thread. This is probably hard to see over a video, but these different brands do have a little bit different quality. You can kind of see that the Sulky is a little bit shinier than the Coates and Clark. So you want to keep this in mind if you are mixing different types of brands that you could potentially get a little bit of a different look if you're doing them in the same embroidery design. This one is definitely softer to the touch than this Coates and Clark one, but like I said, I do tend to use this Coates and Clark brand. There also is specific bobbin thread for doing embroidery. It's just got a little bit of a different makeup. It's a different density than a typical embroidery thread. So you do need to also purchase some bobbin thread for your embroidery machine. So I just use the Coates and Clark embroidery thread and I tend to just stock up on it whenever Joann's has a sale for like buy two get one free I'll just buy a bunch of bobbin thread and I'll also just buy a bunch of white thread and black thread because you go through that the fastest.
And there are specific needles made for embroidery, so you can't just use your normal stretch needles or your universal needles for embroidery. Um, there is a specific type of needle, but again, just make sure whatever you buy is a type that can fit into your machine. And I will bring up my curved embroidery scissors again. Uh, these are one of my favorite tools and they're specifically curved to get really close to your embroidery to trim off extra thread like a jump. Uh, so I do have a test patch here that I can show you what I mean. So you can see how close the scissors can get right up against the embroidery, but you don't run the risk of snipping into the threads because it's laying parallel to the embroidery so you can use these to get really close to trim off extra excess threads. I also use them for getting really close to trimming off extra fabric for doing applique as well. They can get really close to the tack down stitch without actually cutting into the stitch itself. I believe these are just a pair of ginger scissors that I bought off of Amazon. Joann's has a bunch of embroidery scissors as well. Unless you're purchasing embroidery designs with no intent to alter them, you're going to need an embroidery program. And my embroidery program of choice is Ember. So Ember has a standard base program, which is what you're looking at right here. And it also has a lot of add-ons. If you're not planning on designing any of your own, you can just use the base program to slightly alter any designs you purchase. You can rotate them, you can flip them. You can also resize them, but it's not recommended that you resize them too much because the design starts to lose its integrity. It will change the way that the design stitches out and will just generally start to look a little weird. So if you want to make your own embroidery, you need to purchase the digitizing add-on, which this is what you're looking at here. So here you can design your own embroidery. You can design applique as well. You can also just make little stitch lines that could stitch out something like a tooth or a claw, and that way you don't have to sew it yourself. So the base program will not allow you to design your own embroidery. You have to purchase this add-on. And it can be a little expensive to purchase both. It is a one-time fee, though. So unlike other embroidery programs, you only have to purchase it once. Other ones have a monthly fee. There are some free ones out there, but I hear that they have a lot of issues with crashing and everything. So just do your research and decide which embroidery program is right for you. And when I draw out my own patterns, I don't use any fancy materials. I just use normal printer paper. I often use scrap paper, so paper that I've gotten from just random sources that have all sorts of different printing on them or just things that I've printed out like embroidery designs. Rather than waste the paper and just throw it away, I'll just use some scrap paper. Um, and then I just use scissors to cut it out that specifically are not made for fabric. You want to use ones that are dedicated non-fabric scissors and then just normal pens, pencils. You might not want to use anything too permanent because then you can go ahead and erase it if you make a mistake. And I tend not to use markers as well just because it can bleed through the paper. And then also I use a lot of masking tape when making my own patterns because often my patterns are larger than just a standard sheet of paper. So I just use some plain old masking tape to tape my patterns together. If you want to make your own plush patterns, I highly recommend getting a printer and scanner. It sounds really silly, but I felt like getting a printer and scanner has made me a better plush maker because it is so much easier to scan my patterns into my computer and resize them if I want to print out the resize one rather than having to do that all by hand. And as well as for embroidery, I can scan any design that I've drawn directly into my computer so then I can trace that design in my embroidery program rather than having to freehand it on my computer. Printers themselves are pretty cheap. I think this one cost me $17, but where it gets you is the ink. The ink is very expensive, but you can probably print in black and white for the most part 
and that'll last you quite a while. But um, again, highly recommend it if you want to get into making plush patterns yourself. And then of course you're going to need some kind of photo editing program once you get your patterns scanned into your computer. You can use Photoshop if you have a subscription, but it is pretty expensive. I use GIMP, which is free, and it gets me by pretty much just fine. Um, I do have some issues with printing. It doesn't handle printing very well. It doesn't like to print big images. It only lets you print it at the size of the paper. So I tend to do all my editing in GIMP, and then I actually send it over to MS Paint to print it out at full size, which sounds insane that I use MS Paint for anything, but uh, MS Paint is an easy way to just print it out at full size, I find. Now we're going to get into a kind of catch-all category of other random things that I have that are useful for plush making. And first category is for turning out small pieces of plushies. So if you're making like a small tube of fabric that you need to turn right side out, there are different tools that you can use for that purpose. This is one of my most used ones, this little stick that has a prong that comes out that you insert into the tube and kind of roll it back onto this stick to turn it right side out. Uh, you can watch my video on making braids on how to get an idea of how to do that. I have these quick turn tools as well that I have not used yet, but uh, it's another different type of tool for the exact same purpose. But recently I've been using these hemostats or forceps quite a bit. Uh, they're locking, so if you lock them together and pull, they don't come apart. So you can just stick these in the tube, grab the fabric, and just pull it right back out. So I've been using these for a lot of different purposes recently, even for uh, when I turn something out to just push it all the way to the end to make sure that the seam gets pushed all the way out. So these are definitely one of my new favorite tools that I have. And this as well, uh, it's just another tool that I believe is primarily used for pushing open seams. So when you sew a seam, rather than using your iron to press it open, you can run this along the seam to kind of push it open to give it a cleaner finish, but also use this to stick into tiny little pieces that after they've been turned right side out, if I want to get the whole uh, piece pushed all the way to its seam, I'll use these as well. And crazily enough, I've also just adopted a wooden spatula for also pushing pieces out if it's super long and this is kind of flimsy, so I just have a wooden spatula that I use if I'm sewing something really long like a tail that I need to push right side out. I'll just jam this all the way in and push until I get it all the way turned right side out. So a couple other things for cleaning up your plush. Lint roller, minky sheds everywhere and so does faux fur as well. So once you start working with minky and cutting it, it's going to shed all over the place. So I always have a lint roller handy for cleaning it up, especially when I'm doing applique and when you snip the edges, all the little minky pieces are going to get everywhere. So it's easy just to lint roll your hoop before laying on the stabilizer on top and cleaning up all that excess minky so it doesn't get caught in your stitches. And for cleaning up faux fur, I just have a plastic brush that I use. It's helpful for styling your plushies if you have any faux fur details like hair or cheeks or even a tail tip, just having this handy it also helps for uh, pulling the fur out of any seams. If it gets caught in the seam while you're sewing it, you can use a little brush to pull it out. And another random tool that I use a lot is an iron and you guys know what an iron looks like so I'm not going to put it up here for you but I use it for pressing seams open when I have a color change like when I'm doing color blocking on a plush. I also use it a lot for when I make my clothes for my plushies just to give them a cleaner look. And so there's a few different things you can use an iron for in plush making but definitely essential. And just as I was finishing up, Charlotte walked over here to say that cats are an essential tool in plush making and it always helps to have a cat supervisor overseeing your work. So that's going to be it from me today and hopefully you guys learned about something that can help you out in your plush making.
and see you next time. Thanks for watching.